to welcome back our uh, amazing teachers. They've really enlightened us and shared their Torah with all of us. Um, if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, we're delighted to welcome Zevi Berman and Ariel Zitney. They are uh, seminarians from our Reform Movement Seminary, Hebrew Union College, where Ariel is at the current time a Master's Jewish Education student and a Rabbinic student, and Zevi is a Cantorial student and a Master's of Jewish Education student. Um, they are partners in life uh, as, as well, and they really are uh, teaching and transforming our Jewish world around understanding non-binary and gender non-conforming uh, uh, identities and the spectrum of gender identity and gender expression in Jewish life. And we just are so thrilled to have them be our teachers for this third and final session of Beyond the Binary here at Congregation Kolomi. So welcome back our teachers, uh, Ariel and Zevi. Thanks so much, Rabbi Eger, and thanks, Rabbi Chaikin. We are so grateful to be here at Kolomi and to learn with all of you. These are some of our favorite texts to study, so we're excited to share them with you. Um, a little bit about what we are doing in this three session workshop. This is called Beyond the Binary, and we are exploring gender expansiveness in Torah, rabbinic text, and really getting to the foundations of Judaism and where we can see gender expansiveness in Jewish history and Jewish text. So a little bit about our pronouns. My name is Zevi, just to connect name with face, because I know we're two people in a Zoom box. My name is Zevi. I use the pronouns they, them, or ze, them, zer. And I am Ariel, and I use the pronouns he, him, or they, them. So what have we done and what are we still going to do in this course? We have looked at the story of Adam HaRishon, a biblical story of um, gender expansiveness, ways that we can find gender complexity in Torah. And we're gonna meet actually more gender expansive Torah stories today. That is gonna be our focus. Um, last class, we specifically looked at the six rabbinic classifications of gender and how our binary assumptions about rabbinic text might not be all there is, that the rabbis recognize six different genders and that we can similarly expand our minds to understand gender expansively. Um, and our main goal is that we want to look at how we can reconceptualize our Jewish beliefs about gender. How can we look at gender beyond the binary in Judaism in modernity? As we look at these texts, how can they be source material for us in how we can look at the future of Judaism and the future of how we understand gender in Judaism? So for our class today, we will be doing a deeper dive into gender expansiveness in Torah. So we call this class gender queering Torah. We will be looking at two specific examples of characters from our Torah that we can look at in gender expansive ways based on commentaries and interpretations that we have on those texts. And as we have done in the past, so we are going to do today, we're gonna to open up with a Padlet. And the question for today that you can see in the Padlet, both in the chat and on the screen here, is what is one difference between how others perceive you and how you understand yourself? Take a moment to follow the link. And if you're new to Padlet, look for the pink circle with the plus sign at the bottom right hand corner and you can click that and add your comments. You don't need to worry about clicking enter because it starts uploading your comment right as you start writing it. And I am seeing already people contributing to our Padlet and I'm looking forward to seeing all of your answers. One answer that I am hoping is, is complete that I'll read aloud is the parts of my identity that are not visible. Examples are invisible illnesses or how I grew up. 
think that's a wonderful example. Another one is I am cisgender female, but I hate when people label aspects of me as in masculine energy or masculine int intellect. And I see that you're still typing. Another person writes, well, I'm non-binary, but our society has an assumed binary. So usually people just assume a binary gender to me. I feel that very personally. I can empathize with that very much. People think that I'm much younger than I am is another example. People perceive me as female and I am a gender. I see that there are some similarities in some of the comments. I think people perceived me as gay before I perceived myself. So time also interacts interestingly with this question. Absolutely. The ways that we understand ourselves throughout time might be different. We can come to different understandings of ourselves throughout our lifetimes. Feel free to keep adding to this document. I see one last comment of, I am a very complex person and have different aspects that come out at different times. I think this is another way that we can speak about timing. Not only throughout the course of our life do we change, but we can code switch throughout different uh, parts of our lives. Different communities that we're a part of might see different parts of ourselves. So, Whenever we read Torah, we perceive characters through specific lenses, sort of the way that other people perceive us. And just as we understand ourselves complexly and expansively in ways that maybe other people might not perceive or might not understand, we can bring that expansiveness, that complexity to the way that we read Torah and to the ways that we perceive our biblical characters. We read Torah at the end of the day as a reflection of us, a reflection of ourselves. And the question is, how can we read Torah in an expansive way to reflect the many genders of Jews that we know exist both today and that have existed throughout Jewish history? And this is our guiding question for today, seeing Torah as we see ourselves complexly and expansively. So we're going to look specifically at Abraham and Sarah and at Rebecca. <laughs> I see that there's some excitement and I'm really glad. So Abraham and Sarah are often conceptualized as a man and a woman, as a patriarch and a matriarch. There's not so much gender expansiveness that goes into our traditional ideas about Abraham and Sarah. And we'll see that this perception, this simplicity, doesn't exactly reflect the complexity that we find in rabbinic interpretation, in commentaries on Torah. We can understand them much more expansively. And Rebecca, similarly, is conceptualized often as a cisgender woman, as our matriarch, as a very simple understanding of a matriarch. But we're going to closely read her stories and we'll see that gender norms are a way that she sort of expands what biblical gender is often assumed to be as well as we'll look at some of the grammar of her stories and see that actually the words in the Torah also give us a hint to ways that we can understand Rebecca in terms of gender expansiveness as well. So last class, just a little review, we, we learned the six classifications of gender according to the rabbis in the Mishnah and the Talmud. So just to review these different six classifications, we have Zahar, which is traditionally seen as male. We have Nekeva, which is seen as female. We have Androgynos, which is both male and female, a person who has masculine and feminine characteristics. And we met the Androgynos in our story of Adam Harishon of the first human 
where we read the interpretation that the first human was Androgynos before being split in two and becoming Adam and Eve, male and female separated. And next we see Tum Tum. And Tum Tum is someone with indeterminate or obscured gender characteristics. And so this is different from Androgynos, but similarly a person who can't exactly be classified as male or female. And so we will see Tum Tum in one of our uh, stories today. Next, we have Elonit, a person who is assigned female at birth, but develops male or masculine characteristics at puberty. And this person is infertile. We will also be seeing an Elonit in our stories today. And Saris, our last one, is an assigned male at birth person who develops female or feminine characteristics at puberty and or is lacking a penis or testes. And as we went over last class, there are two types of Saris. There is um, Saris Chama, who is a natural Saris, a person who is considered to have been born a Saris. And there is Saris Adam, a person who is considered to be a Saris through human intervention. And a Saris Adam is generally considered to be a eunuch. Okay, so we'll jump in. This is from Yevamot, and this is a uh, piece of Talmud. And I just want to situate us in what we're talking about right now. I feel like many of us are familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah being infertile. Abraham and Sarah are very old. They really want to have children. And God miraculously intervenes, and Sarah becomes pregnant. I'm sure you might remember Sarah laughing when God tells Sarah that she will become pregnant because it is so miraculous because she's at such an advanced age. So this Yivamot text is a commentary on the Abraham and Sarah story of Abraham and Sarah um, conceiving a child. So we read, Rabbi Ami said, Abraham and Sarah were originally tum tumin, this is the plural of tum tum, people of indeterminate gender. As it is stated, look to the rock you were hewn from and to the quarry you were dug from. And this is from Isaiah 51.1. And it is written in the very next verse, look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. Abra Isaiah 51.2 which indicates that the sexual organs were fashioned for them, signified by the words hewn and dug over the course of time. In this way, God caused Abraham and Sarah, who were originally infertile, to become fertile. Okay, this is a little bit complex. And I think the main word that we would like to unpack here is parallelism. The way that Isaiah is brought in is the parallelism between Isaiah 51.1 and Isaiah 51.2. How does it relate to Abraham and Sarah? Well, first let's look at 51.2. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. Okay, so we have this anchor of Abraham and Sarah. We go one verse earlier in Isaiah and it says, look to the rock you were hewn from and to the quarry you were dug from. So we can see this look to the A and to the B. First Abraham and then Sarah. So Abraham is represented by the rock you were hewn from and Sarah is represented by the quarry you were dug from. What does this mean? We can unpack this in two different ways. The first is that rocks and quarries, this is a it's symbolic of the ways that Abraham and Sarah were both infertile. They were both tomb to mean. They were both unable to have children and their genders were obscured. And God miraculously came in and hewn the rock and dug the quarry and made them fertile. And additionally, we can look at it sort of more of a physical standpoint 
of the rock that you were hewn from, from for Abraham represents the making of a phallus, as well as the quarry you were dug from represents the creation of a womb for Sarah. So this all, Rabbi Ami is talking about this miraculous intervention of God stepping in and shifting Abraham and Sarah's genders from what they were originally. But this is only one interpretation. Let's go to the very next one. So then we see Rav Nachman said that Rabba Bar Av Avu said our mother Sarah was initially an Elonit, as it is stated, and Sarah was barren. She had no child. The superfluous she had no child indicates that she did not even have a place, i.e. a womb, for a child. So according to Rav Nachman, Sarah's initial gender was actually a Lanit. So going a step further, I think in order to really get into this, we need to first unpack a little bit more Tum Tumim. So the idea of indeterminate or obscure gender, the rabbis have it in their heads that they're a person is actually male or actually female, but according to what is seen by the eye, you can't tell whether they are male or whether they are female. So maybe physiologically we're envisioning like a Barbie Ken doll situation where there is no indicator either way, but you also don't have any presence of bothness as you do with androgynous. So androgynous you see, there are aspects of both. And with Tum Tum, you kind of get nothing with, with them. And so it's unclear either way. But the idea is that the person actually is a, a gender, but it's unable to be determined at the present what that gender is. And so they have an idea that you could cut open a Tum Tum to reveal which gender they really are but that that's unnecessary. It's invasive and it's potentially dangerous. And so the rabbis just leave it be, but they do have an idea that you could determine with medical intervention, whether the person is actually male or female. And so the idea then is, well, if Sarah was actually Tum Tum, then she would have a womb. It just would be obscured. And they're saying, no, actually, we're going to go a step further and we're going to say she was Elonit to say she didn't even have a womb. And that is back to what Zebi was referring to, that the pit needed to be dug. It didn't exist in the first place. And so God not only made a fertile womb, but made a womb to begin with. In the place where there was no womb, God fashioned a womb. And so Rav Nachman is going, saying, yes, Abraham was Tum Tum, but Sarah was not Tum Tum. Sarah was actually Elonit because she did not even have a womb. So we're wondering for you, how do these two rabbinical interpretations of Abraham and Sarah being Tum Tumim and of Sarah being Elonit, how do these expand the conceptions that you have about Abraham and Sarah? Feel free to drop it in the chat and we can have a little bit of a conversation with each other about the ways that we were taught about Abraham and Sarah and how this differs from that. I see a question, are any of the other genders split into Adam and Chama? That is just Saris, specific to Saris. I see one person said, it's a stretch to look at Sarah as Elonit. 
that is okay. Not every interpretation has to work for every person. That's why there are so many in Talmud. Another person said it definitely adds to slash complexifies the idea of them being patriarch and matriarch, which are very gendered terms. I love that idea. A side note, avot and imahot, similarly gendered patriarch matriarch, one of the words that I really love for uh, biblical ancestors, instead of avotenu or imotenu is kadmotenu. This word kedem, from the beginning, our ancestors, a non-gendered word. It's my new favorite thing. So back to how our interpretations from the rabbis change the way we think about Abraham and Sarah. It shows a fluid version of gender, some person commented. That gender can change as opposed to being fixed. I love that idea. The idea of gender shifting throughout someone's story. It makes me think about how arbitrary gender assignment is. Also a wonderful point. And that Abraham and Sarah's relationship with each other is made complex by this interpretation. Were they siblings or cousins? Did Sarah never speak to Abraham again after the binding of Isaac? We're getting more into their histories. I love the complicating factor that they could be differently gendered. Wonderful. I love conceptualizing this given even more details about what we know of them from Torah. Wonderful. So let's move to Rebecca. So with Genesis 24, we will meet um, the we will meet Rebecca and see specifically the story of Abraham's servant going out and looking for a wife for Isaac. And so he has something special in mind of what Isaac's future wife will look like and he has this conception and he meets Rebecca and so we'll be specifically looking at how Rebecca actually transcends biblical gender norms and something that is really important to situate ourselves in in this conversation is to remember that we're talking about biblical gender norms. And so to understand the way that she is transgressing how women were perceived in society at that time. And that does not necessarily match up with what we consider normative behavior for women today. And so some of this might be a little uncomfortable to say, well, why is that feminine or why is that masculine? And we encourage those conversations and those questions. And when we are situating what we are saying is feminine or masculine, we're only doing so according to the culture at that time. And so we're going to be playing into a little bit of these prescribed gender norms so we can look at the way Rebecca specifically goes against them. So we ask that you be patient with us a little bit if it feels like we're playing into these normative gendered expectations, but hopefully we will then look at how Rebecca's actions really go against all of that, all of those expectations. And so specifically, we're looking at how Rebecca expands biblical gender norms through her strength, being strong and muscular, physically even, and through her agency and independence that she's able to take on roles in society that women did not take on at that time. Okay, so we're gonna read verses 17 through 20 in Genesis 24. And I would love for all of us to read this through the lens of where do we see Rebecca's strength that we might not see in other biblical women and where do we see her agency? Okay. The servant ran toward her and said, please let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, Rebecca said to the servant, and she quickly lowered her jar upon her hand and let him drink. When she had let him drink his fill, she said, 
I will also draw for your camels until they finish drinking. Quickly emptying her jar into the trough, she ran back to the well to draw and she drew for all of his camels. Okay, where do we see strength that might expand some gender norms for biblical women? And where can we see agency in this story about Rebecca? Feel free to drop in the chat some things that you notice. I remember learning about the story of Rebecca growing up and the word that was always used for Rebecca was generous. I learned about Rebecca and her generosity. And absolutely, she is a very, very generous biblical character. And she is exceptionally strong and she has an exceptional amount of independence and agency as a biblical woman. I see a person wrote, it must have taken a lot of strength to draw water for the camels. And Rebecca does a task that requires a lot of upper body strength. Yeah, I am not entirely sure that I would be able to draw enough water for camels out of a very deep well in the desert. That sounds like a huge amount of effort. And it's not often a task that we see biblical women engaging in. For agency, she offered to sate the camels. And this person says, I think of that as a kindness, which later became a law. Feed your animals before you feed yourself. Thank you for that context. Yes. So we have a question. Yes. What was the division of labor for men and women of this time period? It's a very good question. Do you want to start? Yeah, I, I will just say that um, there were activities that were considered to be more of uh, activities for women. And generally something like drawing water from a well while women were uh, water carriers and often were around wells, that also could potentially be a really difficult job as we said earlier, especially when it comes to animals. And so we could see her asking for help with that. And the fact that she didn't ask for help, she didn't go on and say, let me, let me grab some servants, for example. She did it by herself. That is definitely seen as unusual. And we also see her literally running back and forth in order to do it quickly. And I'll also add for agency, the fact that she speaks to a servant, that a servant comes and she is the one who greets him. This is also an anomaly that we don't find in many biblical stories about women. So continuing on, this one, I feel like I wanna frame more in terms of where do we see Rebecca's agency? This is verses 21 through 26. When the camels had finished drinking, the man, this is Abraham's servant, took a gold nose ring weighing a half shekel and two gold bands for her arms, 10 shekels in weight. Pray tell me, he said, whose daughter are you? Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She replied, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. And she went on, there is plenty of straw and feed at home and also room to spend the night. Okay. Where do you see agency in this, in these few verses? How is Rebecca acting independently? I'll add what might be an important detail. The gold nose ring and the two gold bands, those are often viewed as signs of betrothal. So like how today we might exchange a diamond ring, in ancient times, they would exchange bracelets and a gold nose ring. So in what ways does Rebecca show agency as a biblical woman in these verses?
She doesn't ask for time to speak to anyone. The servant is asking her for shelter. And I'll insinuate that the end of that is the servant is asking her for shelter and she gives it. She doesn't ask if she is allowed to extend shelter. She just says, yes, sure, you can stay with us. And she makes the decision to welcome the servant, not asking her father. Yes. Yeah. One of the ways that I see Rebecca acting or that we see Rebecca acting in this story is similar to the story of Abraham greeting the three strangers. The three strangers show up at Abraham's tent and he gives them water and he takes care of them and he greets them and he talks to them and he welcomes them into his tent. What is Rebecca doing here? Pretty much the exact same thing. She is acting for all intents and purposes like the head of her household, which as we said before is an anomaly. And it's also interesting that that in a way is what Abraham's servant specifically asked for what he had envisioned Isaac's wife would be. He is sort of thinking of someone who's similar to Abraham. He wanted someone who, if he asked them for some water, they would extend water not only to him, but to his camels. So we're seeing when he's asking himself, who would be the best match for Isaac? He's thinking of someone who's similar to Abraham, even though we are also switching gender with that. One of the points that we were talking about earlier today is you can't have agency unless people around you support you in doing so. And this is something that we see in the story of Rebecca. The servant doesn't say, where's your father? I have some questions for him. Or who can I talk to about giving you this jewelry that is marks of betrothal? The servant goes to Rebecca specifically and asks her for her opinion and for her help and for her guidance. Um, and we continue to see that in the 57th verse of Genesis 24. So it says, well, to give a little context, this is when um, Abraham's servant asks Rebecca's brothers if he can take Rebecca back to Abraham and Isaac. So he's asking, can we take her now, now that I have found the woman that I was looking for, can we take her back to my master? And this is how Rebecca's brothers respond. They said, let us call the Na'ar Na'ara and ask for her reply. So a small note about Na'ar Na'ara, we chose not to translate this word and to instead include it as the Hebrew version, which as you can see, we put it in both the masculine and the feminine form. Na'ar is masculine, Na'ara is feminine. And Na'ar in Hebrew means young person. So either a young man or a young woman, but we'll get back to Na'ar and Na'ara in just a moment. Right now, we're looking at the fact that when the brothers were asked if Rebecca could come with the servant, they said, let us ask her to make the decision. So they call Rebecca in and ask, Rebecca, do you want to go with this man? And Rebecca is the one who decides. And she says, yes, I will go. And so we also see her brothers could decide legally what she will do. They have that right as, as the men of the household. They could say, no, she's gonna stay with us or yes, she's gonna go with you. But instead they ask Rebecca and Rebecca is given that agency and she decides for herself that she will go. So we've been referring to Rebecca as a woman thus far and using she and her pronouns. But we can see in the text that there is just a little bit more ambiguity than that. Again, similarly to the stories of Abraham and Sarah, Rebecca's gender is not as fixed and not as simple as we might read it on first glance. So we're gonna do a little bit of grammatical sleuthing 
So bear with us, this gets a little bit specific. So we'll uh, open it up for questions if there is some confusion. So to first give a little bit of background, our Torah scroll as it's written in the scroll doesn't have any vowels. It's just consonants. But we have various versions of our Torah text that have added in vowels to make it easier for us to read, to know how to vocalize it and read it out loud. And so in our texts that do have vowels, they have added in a vowel for na'ar. So the consonants themselves are written as if it's in the masculine form, na'ar, ha na'ar. You would expect to see a hey written after the resh if it were in the feminine form, but there is no hey. Although the other words around it are referring to the person in a feminine way. So we have from context the suggestion that it is referring to a woman, but the word itself is written as if it is a young man. And so we are going to distinguish between what is written with the consonants and what you are supposed to read out loud with the vowels. And this is actually something that you see fairly often in the Torah. There are numerous times where something is written as if it is in the masculine form, but then the vowels tell you to read it in the feminine form. And so the way that it is written is kativ. And the way that you read it is kri. So we're gonna call this kri and kativ, the way that you read it versus the way that it's written. And so we can see here as we've circled, we see hey, nun, ayin, resh. And so without any vowels, you would think that says na'ar, ha na'ar. But with the vowels added in, we see there is a kamatz underneath the resh at the very end. So it is meant to be read Hana'ara. And here are two examples from uh, the Rebecca story where Rebecca is referred to in this way. And I'll add, these two are not the only examples that we have of Rebecca being referred to as Hana'ar and Hana'ara according to what is read and what is written. It, is, it occurs over and over and over and over in this story. It's clearly not accidental. So what is the meaning that we can get from this Kri and Kativ? So we wanna present you with two different ways of understanding this. The first is from Malbim. And um, this is a, an example from Rachel Brody's essay about Rebecca um, that, we, that you can find in Torah queries if you would like to read more. So there's a long tradition of deriving additional meaning from this dichotomy of Kri and Kativ, what you read versus what is written, the vowels and the consonants. The Malbim, who is a 19th century Russian Bible scholar, understood the Kri, what is written or what is read, to be the interpretation, the drash, on the word, and the kativ as its literal meaning, the peshat. So how would, according to you, we'd love to hear your interpretation, how would the Malbim's idea apply to Rebecca as na'ar in the kativ, masculine in the kativ, and na'ara in the kri, feminine in the kri? How would you take Malbim's interpretation of Kree and Kativ and apply that to Rebecca. <laughs> I see that this is getting a little bit complex. Let me see if I can simplify it a little bit. So according to the Malbim, Rebecca as feminine, Rebecca as na'ara, the feminine part of Rebecca, is the interpretation of the Torah story. But the literal meaning 
is Rebecca as masculine, Rebecca as Na'ar. If the literal meaning is Rebecca as masculine and only the interpretation is Rebecca as feminine, how does that influence the way that you see Rebecca as a biblical character? Does that clarify it just a little bit? So I see um, we have a question. I wanna make sure I'm understanding this. Pre is like connotation and kativ is like denotation. According to the Malbim, yes. If we were to see the specific denotation of the text as Rebecca, the masculine Na'ar, and the connotation as Rebecca, the feminine Na'ara, what picture does that paint of Rebecca in your head as a biblical character? I think it's actually the opposite, right? Cree is the interpretation. So Cree would be the connotation and Kativ is the literal meaning. So Kativ would be, oh, that is what you, I'm sorry. You I'm getting confused now, but. <laughs> This gray area is, is a fun place to live in. We can all live in it together. So I see that a person um, wrote when the story was being studied and written down with vowels, people were interpreting her as a feminine, as feminine or a woman, but in actuality, Rebecca may have been defined as masculine. Great, that's a, that's a really wonderful way to, to summarize this, yes. So it makes me think of how does that change the way that we talk about Rebecca, the way that we think about Rebecca as Isaac's potentially new wife in this story. Okay, we're going to attempt to further complicate it We'll see if we can get there together. This is going to take what we had and it's gonna flip it upside down. So this is a new way of seeing it, a different way of seeing Cree versus Kativ. So we see here, similarly, discrepancy between Cree and Kativ. One means one thing, one means another. But Rav Soloveitchik, a 20th century American Orthodox Talmudist, associates the Cree with a person's exterior public self, while the Kativ is the more interior emotional self. So the Cree is what other people would see, the way that it is read would be the way that other people see you, but the Kativ, the way that it's written, is the way that you know yourself to be. And so how would Rob Soloveitchik's interpretation apply to Rebecca as Na'ar, with the Kativ being the more interior emotional self, and Na'ara, the Cree, being Rebecca's exterior self. Feel free to shoot us some questions in the chat if this is a little bit confusing to you, but perhaps you like this interpretation better and it's easier to grasp. I see a person commented, so mentally Rebecca was masculine and exterior feminine. So maybe Rebecca was a masculine woman or a gender non-conforming woman or a trans masculine non-binary person or a tomboy. I love all of the different ways that we can possibly imagine Rebecca as more complex than simply our matriarch. Yeah, I think that opens up the idea that seeing the discrepancy between the ways that someone might be perceived and the ways that they feel about themselves that actually can happen in so many different ways. It's not, it's not a singular experience. And seeing that Rebecca could have been interpreted in one way and actually been a different way 
in her interior, that can be a really, it can, it can explain so many different identities and experiences. And this reminds me of what a few of you put in the Padlet at the beginning of class, where possibly your Kativ, the more interior emotional life that you have, doesn't quite match the Cree, your Cree, your exterior public self, the way that you are viewed by other people. And I see just in the examples of what Rebecca's gender could be and the differences between Rebecca's Cree and Kativ, that shows us the complexity that we can read our biblical characters with and the ways that we can see ourselves in these biblical stories. Okay, so this is a very complex. There is a lot of different interpretations and a huge amount of gray area. With this idea of Rebecca living in the gray area, what is something that you are taking away from this close reading of Rebecca in the Torah. This can be expanding gender norms biblically, emphasis on biblically, or it can be looking at Rebecca as a Na'ar and a Na'ara, both at the same time. I see a person posted, I think I'll use they them pronouns for Rebecca for a while. I love it. I wonder how many other biblical people have genders that aren't so easily defined. Yes. I'm just thinking about how folks might say this expansion is us reading our view into things, but why isn't that true of traditional readings? I think that's a beautiful point. Every time we read Torah, it is an interpretation of Torah. Every time we take meaning from Torah, it is a reflection of who we are and the ways that we bring our beliefs and ourselves into our Jewish texts. And every interpretation I believe is a valid, wonderful way of engaging with the text. I think also that's reminding me of what was said earlier about Abraham and Sarah, of someone said, you know, that sounds like a stretch to me. And I think that's something that I personally love about our Jewish tradition of interpretation. Uh, we have even these traditional interpretations that the rabbis made a thousand years ago. And we can look at that and say, you know, I'm not really buying that. That seems like a stretch to me. And then we can also carry on that interpretive tradition ourselves. And we have the agency to take our text and to own it in the same way and to add our own interpretations to the conversations, knowing that someone else might take our interpretation and say, you know what, that sounds like a stretch to me. And we all have the power to say that to each other. I see someone posted, it's really interesting to think about that because gender isn't discussed much with most of the characters. It's more focused on what they did but there could easily have been many others with differing gender identities and presentations. It just wasn't made note of in the text, I think. And another person posted, these biblical figures are more like me than I initially thought. I think they are reflective of the complexity of all of us as human beings. Gender expansiveness is something we find in modern day and something we find in the foundations of Judaism, both the same. And I think similarly with human beings and with our biblical texts of sometimes we need to pause and do a close reading and find out more information and ask questions because on first assumption, we might, we might make a wrong assumption. So similar with human beings, sometimes we need to ask questions to find out more about the person. We can't just look at someone and assume that we know their identity. Similarly with our biblical texts of sometimes we need to take a deeper look because on first read, we're not, we're not getting the full story. One of the things that I saw in what each of you, in what some of you wrote is, I wonder if there's more. And the good thing is there definitely, definitely is. So, here is a little bit of our view. Biblical characters who were chosen to be the patriarchs and the matriarchs, I put this in quotes because we know that it's more complex, of the Jewish people are often gender expansive. In addition to the first human, Adam Harishon, 
and Abraham and Sarah and Rebecca, there are also additional stories we could learn about Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. There's more and more and more. It's not an accident that so many of the biblical ancestors expand our views on gender. They live outside of the gender binary. And by choosing them, specifically them, to be the foundations of the Jewish people, we believe that God is marking gender expansiveness as holy. Gender beyond the binary, it's not an add-on to Judaism. It's not just a modern conception or a modern read into Jewish text. Gender expansiveness has been a part of Judaism since the beginning. And this is what we find over and over and over studying these texts. I love that someone posted, this makes me want to study more Torah and gender in Torah. This makes us want to study more gender in Torah too. So as we started, we would love to end. And this is a little bit more of an expansive question, not just about this class on Torah, but on bringing all of the three workshops that we participated in with all of you into our lives as Jews beyond this class. So the question is, and we posted the link in the chat and it's also on your slide. How has your understanding of gender in Judaism shifted throughout this course and how will you share this knowledge with others? We hope that we have just simply planted seeds that can blossom into further study and further conversations for you as Jews and for the Kol Ami community and for the wider Jewish communities that we live in. I see there are quite a few people typing. One person wrote, strengthened my understanding of sacred texts that challenge the gender binary. Another person said, some of this is already familiar because they were studying Torah queries with their rabbi. That is wonderful to hear. Torah queries is a wonderful book and I believe it is on our table right now. The ways that the texts were taught to me growing up are not the only way to interpret them. And I'm excited to look at texts through a new, new lens. There's more trans non-binary intersex representation than I initially thought. And I want to share this in order to combat transphobia that is sometimes too present in religious spaces. Amen to that. seems very much in alignment with what is encouraging me to convert. There's always room for questioning and expansion. These are really inspirational. I really enjoy reading them. We really enjoy reading them. Mm -hmm. I, I, so um, both the person who said that, that you want to share this in order to combat transphobia that is sometimes present and um, and, and some of the comments in the chat here in Zoom also, I, I just wanna add, Katie, when you say, why isn't that true of traditional readings? Um, and, and Diane, when you ask about the ultra-Orthodox, one thing that I want to underscore for us is that I don't think that what we are doing in this space or this course is, um, is, is all that new or or crazy progressive in the sense that we're interpreting the text. We've always had to interpret the text to make meaning from it. The ultra-Orthodox do that in their way. It's a way that we would have a lot of challenges with and maybe a lot of rigorous, uh, hopefully at times respectful disagreement. But um, orthodoxy also interprets the text and applies it to life, just like we have to do that to make meaning from our sacred texts. Um, that's a, it's a core value that, that Zevi and Ariel have, have so 
beautifully modeled for us over this three week course um, with respect to gender, but um, it's not just about, it's not even just about gender, right? It's about any way that we want our sacred text to be meaningful to our lives. We have to be the ones to feel empowered, to learn them, to study them, to make meaning from them. Um, that's what we try to do week in, week out here at Kola Me, um, and with our Open Yad project, our 20s and 30s community. Um, and we're so glad you've all been a part of that um, in this setting with our teachers, Ariel and Zevi. Thank you so much for having us. And that's such a wonderful thing to leave us with. Every denomination of Judaism is has access to Yivamot, has access to Malbim, has access to Rav Solveitchik, and we all make meaning in different ways when we bring ourselves to the text. Well, thank you all so very much for being with us today for this concluding session of Beyond the Binary. Um, as Rabbi Egger just put into the chat, we would be honored if you'd consider a donation in honor of our teachers for this course. Um, you will uh, be able to find the link there in the chat in order to do that. Um, we also, of course, would love to see you all soon again for any of our online programs. Also coming up some opportunities to gather safely for prayer in person. Um, you can find out everything on our website, kol-ami.org. By now, I hope you know how to spell it, but I'll tell you anyway, k-o-l-a-m-i.org. Um, we hope to see many of you at our annual gala next Saturday evening, this Saturday evening, really, um, coming up on the 24th. Um, one of our biggest fundraisers of the year. Um, we're so excited that so many of you are already planning to celebrate with us for our honorees. Um, Rabbi Egger is putting in the chat our upcoming Shabbat uh, Awakening and Shavuot service experiences that will be hybrid in our parking lot. You can join us for. Um, and again, uh, we if you are in your 20s and 30s, um, we would love for you to connect with our Open Yad project. You can email me to make sure you're getting our Open Yad project newsletters by emailing Open Yad at coldashami.org and have a great afternoon Shavuot Tov everyone thanks for being with us thank you thank you thank you again Zevi and Ariel for your incredible teachings we're, we're deeply grateful thanks everybody <laughs>